Well, let's go to Mark chapter 2. We are going to continue our study this morning as we march toward the end of the spring season. We felt led of the Lord that we are going to dedicate the months of January, February, March, and April toward teaching through the book of Mark. Unless the Holy Spirit shifts us a bit, my plan as of now that I feel led of the Lord in is that we will spend a week, uh, a, a, every week we will go through a chapter. So last week we were in chapter one and we talked about the man with leprosy and how leprosy represented our sin and how he broke protocol, he broke custom, he broke the law, approached Jesus kneeling before him and said, if you will, you can make me clean. And our thought last week is, while we do not question Christ's power nor his ability, many of us often question his willingness, just like this leper did. And Christ answered some very sweet words to him. Christ said, I will. And he touched him and made him clean. Amen. And we saw that just as Christ will touch the leper, Christ also will touch our lives today. Well, today we're going to meet a very interesting man who the Bible does not give us his name. The Bible does not give us his backstory. We don't know his background. We actually know very little about him, but what we do know is incredibly important. Today we're going to look at a couple different groups of people, actually a few groups of people. We're going to see, number one, the crowd that gathered around Jesus that day out of chapter 2. We're going to see, number three, the friends that brought this man to Jesus. There were four friends. And then, number three, we're going to see the scribes, the Pharisees, those, the religious folks of this day and how they thought concerning Jesus. I think that we are going to see ourselves in one of these three categories of people. Either you're going to see yourself in the crowd You're going to see yourself in the four men that carried him to Jesus, or you're going to see yourself in the religious people. I think all of us will be able to identify with what the Bible calls the paralytic. This man suffered from a paralysis. He was unable to walk. He was paralyzed. And just as we saw last week, just like the man with leprosy represented sin, he represented an inability to come to Jesus. He was blocked by the law. He was blocked by his disease, by his condition. So it is today, Mark is going to paint a picture for us, and we're going to see in the man who is paralyzed our inability to come to Christ on our own. Some people live as though they can choose to get right with God at any moment they want. Some people say, well, let me enjoy my youth, or let me enjoy my my time of life, my season of life, and then when I retire, I'll get serious about God. When I have a family, I'll get serious about God. When I begin to raise children, when I get out of college, after I get married, or when I get this next job, or there's always a but. And the point, I think of this man who is a paralytic, the point is that you and I cannot and we do not come to Christ on our own. There is an inability. There is a lameness a crippleness, a disability, a handicap that you and I cannot come to God on our own. I identify with this man like never before. Most of you know that I went completely blind in 2018. I lost sight in my left eye through two failed surgeries in 2017. And I lost complete sight in my right eye in 2018, leaving me 100% blind. People ask me all the time, can you see any light at all? No. I feel like I identify a bit with how this man must have felt when his friends strapped him to a bedding, to a stretcher, and these four men carried him. 
You know, I know what it feels like, and some of you with disabilities will identify with this. I know what it's like to go into a restaurant and feel like all eyes are on me as I try to navigate through. When I first went blind, Sadie and I went to a minister's banquet at the Carnegie Hall or the Carnegie Hotel in um, Johnson City, and I was just really going blind. I could still see just a bit out of the corner of my eye. And I remember we went to a very lovely dinner that night and had a great time. And I went to the restroom by myself. And I remember for the first time not being able to get out of a room by myself. I couldn't find the door. It took me a long time to even get out. I was so embarrassed. I know what it is to walk through an auditorium of people and try to walk up here on this platform and feel for the podium and all eyes be on me. I know what it feels like, especially to try to go off the platform. That's when I really need your prayers. <laughs> Cause one misstep and it's a healing service, all right? I know what it is to have all eyes on you because of a disability. And I can imagine how this man felt. I really can't. I can't imagine what it would have felt like for them to have strapped him on this stretcher and tear out a roof and literally lower him down with all eyes on his handicap and on his disability. It had to have been an incredibly vulnerable and an incredibly embarrassing moment. Let's go through the story together. Verse number one, if you'll follow along with me, and we're going to identify a few groups of people in this text. Mark chapter two, look at verse one. And after some days, he returned to Capernaum. Now, if you write in your Bible, you ought to circle Capernaum right there because that's a big, this is a big thing. We know that Jesus was raised in Nazareth, but we believe that in, later in his adulthood, particularly through his three-year earthly ministry. How do we know Jesus ministered for three years? Because in the Gospel of John, he records three consecutive Passovers. So that would tell us that Christ's earthly ministry, beginning with the time of his baptism, from the time of his baptism to the time of his crucifixion, was three Passovers. So that tells us his earthly ministry was for three years. And it appears from the scriptures that while Christ ministered during these three years, he had moved from Nazareth, his hometown, to Capernaum. So in other words, you should view Capernaum like this. It was, it was a neighborhood. You could view it as a neighborhood of the North Galilee shore. And this became the home base of Jesus' earthly ministry. And Capernaum is going to have a major play in the New Testament because most of Jesus, of his earthly activity, was really confined to this big neighborhood. It's where he did most of his recorded miracles. And do you know what Jesus is going to tell Capernaum in Matthew 11? He's going to pronounce judgment on them. And because they saw the physical healings of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, the salvation, the kingdom of God, and yet they would not repent, do you know what Jesus says of Capernaum? It will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for Capernaum. Wow. So it says he came back to Capernaum and it was reported he was home. Now that word home is interesting here. We know through the scriptures that Jesus never owned a home. For he said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, yet the Son of Man does not have anywhere to lay his head. Jesus never owned a home. Isn't that something? The creator of heaven and earth, the Lord of heaven and earth, never had a home. Scholars believe that this was Peter's home. So you and I today, God willing, through our mind's eye and in a, through, through, through that incredible gift of imagination, I want us to put ourselves in Peter's living room, in the pages and the verses of Mark chapter 2, and we're going to put ourselves there and we're going to see the story, God willing, as we've never seen it. If you remember in chapter 1, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. We believe this was Peter's home. We believe Jesus lived with Peter for a while during his earthly ministry. And we believe this is his home in Capernaum. 
Now, verse 2, Mark is going to take his paintbrush and he's going to begin to paint the picture for us. Notice what he says in verse 2. He says, and a crowd gathered so much that even at the door, there was not room for such a crowd. I remember when I was a kid, I had the opportunity to do mission trips to the former communist bloc of Europe. I had a family friend that took me the summers. I was 12 and 13, and I hung around these giants of the faith, these, these giants of mission work. And I went to Romania and Ukraine and Hungary and Germany and all these places with these giants of the faith. And in Romania particularly, communism had only fallen like three or four years prior and I remember, even as a kid, it put such a mark on me. And I remember that they would take me from church to church and village to village. And churches we would go to were just overflowing with hungry souls. Because the grip of communism had been so strong. And once it was broken and people were free, oh, they flocked to the house of God. I remember particularly going to one village in northern Romania, right on the Ukrainian border called Dohoi. And I remember we drove up to the church and literally there were more people outside the church than what could fit inside. I remember being a kid and seeing that they had speakers set up and there was just this throng of people all over the place outside listening to God's word. That's what I picture verse two was like. Mark doesn't tell us how many were crowded about. We don't know. It could have been a crowd of 30. It could have been a crowd of 70. It could have been 120. It could have been 500. We don't know. My personal thought is there were probably hundreds. And they crowded in. And notice in verse number two, I want you to notice what Mark is careful to tell us. He doesn't tell us how many the crowd is, but notice what Mark does tell us. Christ preached the word to them. Oh, what an instruction for today's church. You know, my friends, I love it when the Holy Spirit moves. I love it times. Listen, there are times we gather in this building and I can feel the wind from another world blow through this place. There are times that during our worship set, God will begin to stir things and All of a sudden, prayer breaks out and people spontaneously begin coming forward for prayer. And we lay hands on people. We pray over people. There are times that God just takes our little program and throws it out the window and the Holy Spirit moves however he wills. Amen. Amen. Praise God for it. But let me tell you, of all the wind that may blow, of all the water that may stir, of all the things that we love that the Holy Spirit does. Let me tell you what is primary at Preaching Christ Church. Let me tell you what is the primary function of our church. It is the preaching of the word. Amen. Because that's what God uses to transform lives. He anoints the preaching of his word. And nothing, nothing has more primary place than the teaching, the explaining, the expository, the proclaiming, the heralding, the trumpeting, the preaching of God's word. It is primary. So Christ preached the word that before a miracle ever took place. Christ preached the word. Friends, you and I need to pay attention to that model. Listen, God does miracles here. We've seen people healed. We've seen people set free. We've seen people repent. We've seen God answer prayers that have blown our minds. But listen, before the miracles take place, the preaching of the word must take place. Amen. Verse number two. So get in your mind's eye. There is a crowd all over the place. We don't know how many. I think there were hundreds. And Christ is preaching the word. Oh, what a preacher he must have been. And now verse three, how interesting. The Bible says that they brought to him a paralyzed man, a paralytic. Someone who was lame, someone who was crippled. They brought him on a stretcher on a bed and four men carried him. Oh, I, I, you know, this is fascinating scripture to me. 
The Bible doesn't tell us how far they carried him. We don't know if he was in the neighborhood. We don't know if he lived a few doors down. We don't know if he was miles away. We don't know if it took him a day's journey. We don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. But nonetheless, they were faithful to bring their friend. They were whole. They were healthy. But they brought this crippled man. They brought him to Jesus. Now remember, the crippled man represents us in our sin. You know, Romans chapter 5, verse 6, that would be a great scripture for you to note here. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 says that when we were without strength, some translations say when we were weakened, the word picture there is crippled. When we were without strength, when we were in a weakened condition, Christ died for the ungodly. Amen. So these four men, They bring their friend to Jesus. No doubt they had heard of the miracles. They had heard how Jesus could touch him. And they determined, we're going to get our friend to Jesus. Now, we don't know anything about these four men. You know, one day when I get to heaven, I would love to look them up and really learn their backstory. I mean, again, if you don't mind, I'll let my imagination run wild in this text. And I picture maybe maybe these five guys, maybe they grew up together. Maybe they went to high school together. Maybe they played football together at Jerusalem High. I don't know. But maybe they were fishing buddies. Maybe they hung out all the time. And I don't, I don't know the backstory, but I can't help but to think they were extremely close. And they were so diligent that no matter what it took, they were going to get their friend to the Lord Jesus Christ. What exceptional friends they must have been. And verse 4 is where the story really turns. I don't know if they carried their friend a few streets. I don't know if they carried him a few miles. But their hopes must have been incredibly dashed when they saw the crowd. Their hearts must have sank because the Bible says in verse 4 that they could not even get near Jesus. Can you imagine going to all the effort? Can you imagine going to all the trouble? Can you imagine showing up at your paralyzed friend's house and maybe he even thought about backing out? Maybe he said, guys, I don't know about this. I can tell you as a man with a handicap, as a man with a disability, it is nerve-wracking to go out in public sometimes. And I can hear the man getting up that morning and going, I don't know. I don't know. There's going to be a lot of people there. It's already going to be hard to get to him. What if he won't touch me? What What if he does touch me and it doesn't work? I don't know. I think I would be more comfortable staying home. I know that feeling. And I imagine his friends go, nope, come on, you're going. Strap him in. Let's go. We're going to go see Jesus. And however long they must have carried him, each on each corner, and they're carrying their friend. And however long it took, I imagine they're talking about, can you imagine what it's going to be when Jesus touches him? Can you imagine? He, he's had compassion on so many. He's pitied so many. He's already touched so many. I know he's going to touch you. And imagine how their hearts sank when they got to the crowd and they couldn't even get near the door. Let's talk about this crowd for a minute. I don't like this crowd. Let me tell you why I don't like this crowd. Number one, let me tell you why they were a selfish people. Number one, because, like I said, Jesus pronounced his judgment on the city. They saw the greatest miracles of God, and yet they wouldn't repent. Even at the end of our text in verse 12, the Bible says that they were amazed, but it never says that they repented. Miracles are not meant to amaze you. They're meant to lead us to repentance. Let me tell you another reason I don't like this crowd. Let me ask you a question. If you and I were on the back rows of this crowd, and you and I were toward the back, and we were tiptoeing, and we were, we were straining just to hear Jesus, just to get a glimpse of him. And let me ask you a question. If four men brought a paralyzed man on a stretcher, what would you and I do? I would get out of the way. I would say, please, 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 get him to Jesus. See what the master will do. 
Take him, please, part. Excuse me, excuse me, make way. Is that not what you would have done? But you know what this selfish crowd do? They never moved. They never got out of the way. This man could not even get near the master because of these people's selfishness. And may I propose that there are some listening today May I propose that there are some of us that yes, we are Christian in name. We are Christian in the sense we're interested in Jesus. But we're mightily selfish. Do you know what this crowd became this day? They became a hindrance. They became a roadblock. They became an obstacle to this man getting to Christ. And do you know what Christians who are Christian in name only, do you know what Christians who don't live right, they don't live authentic, they don't live genuine, they are fake and they are phony. Do you know what those Christians are? You're an obstacle. You're in the way of people legitimately coming to Christ. You live a lifestyle that someone says, if he's a Christian, if she's a Christian, then I'll be just right the way I am. You're an obstacle to people coming to Christ. Do you know who these people were? They were curious about Christ. They were interested in Christ. But all they wanted to do is hang out and hang around the things of God. But they were not going to repent. And they were not going to follow Christ. And there's many of you listening. You're in the same boat. Yeah, you're interested. Yeah, you like the music. You like the sermons. You like the idea of praying. You like the idea of going to heaven. You like the idea of being called a Christian. But you're not the real thing. And your life doesn't proclaim Christ. You know what? You are my friend. You're an obstacle to others coming to Christ. Are you just part of the crowd? Are you sitting in the seats today and you're just a crowd? That's it? I would challenge you, my friends. Get serious about the Lord Jesus Christ. Not serious about religion. Serious about Jesus. Serious about following Christ. Giving him your life. And saying, Lord, I am yours wholeheartedly. Don't just be part of the crowd. So, verse (laughs) 4. So all these people's in the way. And I'm just stunned that they don't part the crowd and people don't get out of the way and say, please, please, please take my spot. Here, here, get him to Jesus. I'm just amazed. So these men have to get creative. And do you know what they do? I picture they huddle up over their... I picture they set him down on the ground and they huddle up over him. And I don't know. The Bible doesn't say this. I'm I'm making this up. I'm just letting my imagination detect. But I, I, I picture one or two of them must have been a roofer by trade. I just believe that. <laughs> I can't wait to meet them one day in heaven. And I'm, really, I'm going to ask all four of them, were any of you a roofer? You know why? Because one of them says, I have an idea. We'll tear the roof off. And I imagine their other buddy go, and we're going to get arrested. And I imagine him going, it's all right. I'm a roofer. I'll fix it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But let me tell you how homes were constructed in this day. Scholars tell us a home would have been one level with a staircase outside going to the roof. And see, in this Palestinian area of Judea, they would have enjoyed cool mornings and cool evenings up on their roof. This was very common. And the way the house would have been constructed, we believe this was Peter's house, There would have been a great room right in the middle of the structure, which today we would call that a a living room or a family room, a sitting room. It would have been a place to entertain and to host guests. And Jesus was probably sitting, probably in Peter's chair, (laughs) in his great room. And these men would have headed up the staircase on the outside, and they would have went up to the roof. And let me tell you how a roof was made in these days. In these days, they would have taken thick wooden beams and they would have 
laid them across the structure. But on top of the wooden beams, they would have put a layer of thatch. And on top of the layer of thatch, they would have caked in thick mud. And the mud would have dried and hardened. Then they would do another thick layer of thatch. And then on top of that layer of thatch, they would have put tiles. And that would have been the roof in Jesus' day. What these four men would have done is they would have taken their friend on the stretcher up the outward staircase onto the roof and they would have began to remove the tiles. Now think how long a stretcher bed would have been. I would say at least six or seven feet that they would have had to remove of this roof. And they start tearing the tile out. And see, it's interesting. In another gospel, it tells us they dug through the roof. Now, why would you suppose that is? Remember, we said of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We said this last week. Three are synoptic. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What does synoptic mean? Syn, as in S-Y-N, the, it, where we get our word synonym, meaning the same. Optic, as in optical. View, perspective, vision. In other words, it's taking the same content, the same as in synonym, it shows us the same content. But yet there are different details that if you read it carefully, you'll gain an enormous appreciation. It is not any contradiction. It's just more detail to the story. So in one of the Gospels, it tells us that they dug through the roof. Well, why does it say they dug? Because it would have been wooden beam, thatch, mud, thatch, ceiling tile. And can you imagine Peter sitting beside Jesus and all of a sudden mud and dirt and thatch start falling on your heads? I bet Peter thought, who is ruining my roof? And these men dug through the roof. Let me tell you, my friends, they they would stop short of nothing to get their friends to Christ. Let me ask you a question today. Do you see yourself in this story? Are you the crowd that's an obstacle to someone coming to Jesus? Is your lifestyle an obstacle to people Trusting in Christ and following Christ? Or are you like these four men? You're so passionate about seeing people come to the Lord Jesus that you'll do anything to bring people to Christ. Let me tell you why God has his hand on our church. Let me tell you why God, as we look back over 2021 and we measure what that year was like, and as we cast our eyes to the wonderful year of 2022, let me tell you why God's hand is all over our church. Because let me tell you our mission. Let me tell you our vision clearly. We will tear off any roof to get people to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is everything that we are about. We are about carrying the lame and carrying the crippled and bringing them to repentance of Jesus. It is everything to us. Ask us what our bottom line is. And you know what we'll tell you every time? The souls of men and women. That's our bottom line. And we'll stop at nothing. We'll spend any amount of money it takes. We'll move heaven and earth. We'll do everything humanly possible to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is primary. I don't know about you, but I want to be cut from the same cloth of these four men that brought a crippled man to Jesus. This is who I want to be. Thursday, we reached out to the seed company. I'm getting ready to write an article on maybe a term that many of you have never heard before. We reached out to the seed company who are Bible translators. They're a division of Wycliffe Bible translators. We give an enormous amount of money for Bible translation work. And you know what we are called? As a church, let me tell you, we don't have stock. Well, church wouldn't have stock, but we especially don't have... We don't have money market accounts. We don't have mutual funds or IRAs or any, any kind of, we don't have those things. Let me tell you who we are. We are Bible investors. 
Some of you are investors. But let me ask you, have you ever been a Bible investor? What's a Bible investor? It's people who believe so deeply in the transformation, redemption work of Christ that we will stop at nothing to translate the scriptures for people, groups who have no Bible in their language. This week, we contacted the seed company and or or last week, rather, this week we're going to cut a check and we are going to translate all 105 verses of the book of 1 John to a people group who doesn't have it. And what is it going to be for a people group who have never read the Bible in their native language, in their mother tongue? And what is it going to be when for the first time they read, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, we will tear off any roof to get people to Jesus. Ever heard of the man named Voltaire? I I can't see you. I don't know. Okay, yes, some of you have. Okay. (laughs) Voltaire was an English, I'm sorry, a French enlightener. Some of you may have studied him. Let me tell you about Voltaire. He was a wicked and a godless man. He was a wicked man. Look up the way Voltaire died. It is said he had a very painful death, and as he died, it is recorded that he died screaming as he felt the flames of hell lapping about his feet. That godless man, that wicked man, do you know what he is famously quoted as? As he mocked God Almighty, as he mocked believers of his day, and as he made an utter mockery of the word of God. Do you know what he is famously said to have quoted as saying? He said, 100 years from my day, there will not be one Bible left on planet earth. What a foolish man. Do you know what happened when that godless man died? (laughs) Christian businessmen. What would today be modern day Gideons? Christian businessmen gathered together, pulled their resources, purchased his estate. And his home became the largest Bible printing distribution hub for Bibles in all of Europe. Amen? Amen. And let me tell you, this church is cut from that exact same cloth. We are committed to translating Bibles, printing Bibles, distributing Bibles all over the earth. We have distributed, I don't even know the count, I don't even know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands copies of the word of God. Why? Because you know what Jesus said? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will abide forever. Friends, we are Bible investors. We invest in eternity. These men tore the roof off. They stopped at nothing to get their friend to Jesus. Now, (coughs) look with me at verse 5. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic. Now, stop right there. Mark is so specific. I want to show you. He doesn't say, Mark did not record. And when Jesus saw the faith of the paralytic, it doesn't say that, does it? Do you know why I believe it doesn't say that? This is just my personal belief. I don't want to read too much into the text. But see, I think these friends had more faith than he had. I think these friends pushed him to go. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I know what it's like to hate to go out to a restaurant. I know what it's like to spill things in public. I know what it's like to bump my way around or to miss a curb or to walk into a half open door. I know what these things are. And I think when they said, 
We're going to strap you to this thing, and we're going to lower you down from the roof. I thought, I bet he thought, you guys are crazy. No, no, no. And when they lowered him down, I want you to note, the Bible says when Jesus saw whose faith? Their faith. How many of you right now got people on that cross? How many of you right now, you have prodigals nailed to that cross, and right now, they don't have faith. Right now, they're resisting Jesus. Right now, they won't come to Christ. But let me tell you, my friend, God sees your faith. He sees your faith. And don't get me wrong, they have to have faith. But let me tell you, hallelujah, their faith is coming in the name of Jesus. But right now, you are caring to Jesus. You are bringing them to the Lord. You're pushing them along. You're saying, I know God is going to change your life. Hallelujah. And it might be that God is seeing your faith in them today. Amen. So don't grow discouraged. Don't, you say, Chad, another year has come and gone and they're still not come to faith. Don't get discouraged. You keep shouldering it. You keep carrying them. You keep bringing them along because eventually the master is going to touch them. Amen. Amen. Now, verse number six, we've seen the crowd and how selfish they are. We've seen the four men and how determined they are. We've seen the paralytic and in my view, how embarrassed he was. But Jesus, verse 5, sees this faith, their faith. And he says to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven. Now, the story is going to change gears right here. And, and follow along with me. Verse number 6. Now, some scribes were sitting there and questioning Jesus. Questioning him. You know, people aren't any different today. You know, I realize that as I preach the truths of God's word, people don't just sit there and because, you know, it's scripture. People don't sit there and go, oh, yes, yes, that's it. No, people don't, people internalize things and they go, I don't know if I believe that. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if I agree with that. You know, people are no different today than they were 2,000 years ago. Many of you listening today, you're questioning. You're questioning. I don't know if I agree with that. I don't know if I believe that. But let me show you what Jesus did. Look at verse 6, verse 7. In verse 7, here's what they're saying in their hearts. They say, why this man says he can forgive sins. That's blasphemy. <coughs> no one can forgive sins but God. It's hard for us to pick up in our English language, but in the original manuscripts, in the Greek language, when Mark writes, this man... It's very derogatory. This is a derogatory construction in the Greek language. You can sort of hear it in our English. I mean, you can picture him going, well, how can this man say this? But in the Greek, it's very emphatic. In the Greek, it stands out, and it's extremely derogatory. But if you're going to take notes today, what I would do if I were you in your Bible, I would circle the two words, this man... And I would draw an arrow down to verse number 10, and I would circle the title, Son of Man, because those two are going to link, and I'll link them in just a second. But pay attention to the link there. So verse 6, they're going to question in their heart. Verse 7, the questioning becomes derogatory. Well, who does he think he is? He's but a man. And then verse 8, notice it says, and immediately. Now, there's our key word for Mark, remember? The word immediately or straightforward in the Greek, it's ethos, E-U-T-H-O-S. Remember what we said last week? Ethos, immediately, straightforward. It is used 41 times in the book of Mark alone. It's used seven in the book of Matthew, once in the book of Luke, and 41 times in the book of Mark. It's only used 40 sometimes in the rest of the entire scripture, New Testament. But yet 41 times just in the book of Mark. Why? Because it speaks to the fast pace, to the action. It reads like an action script. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit, 
He knew their thoughts. He knew what they were saying in their heart. Friends, just like people today question the Lord, let me tell you, Jesus today knows every single thing you're thinking in your heart. Do you realize that? Remember what he said to the church of Thyatira in Revelation chapter two? He has eyes of flaming fire. What does that mean when scripture says the eyes of the Lord are as flames of fire? It means his eyes are piercing. It means nothing is hidden from his sight. That means you can come in here and blend in with everybody and then live an incredibly sinful life behind closed doors and the Lord sees that. And the Lord knows that. You can sing the songs but be derogatory toward the things of God in your heart. And the Lord Jesus sees that and knows that. And so Jesus sees it. He knows what they're thinking. And note what he says, verse number nine. He's going to ask this culture a question that's just as pertinent and just as relevant to our generation today. Watch what he says. He says, which is easier to say, Rise, take up your bed and walk, or your sins are forgiven. Which is easier to do? See, in that day, people believed that physical healing was easier than salvation, than the forgiveness of sins. Friends, do you realize that in our culture today, it's just the opposite? If you ask the average believer... Just the average Christian. Can God forgive anyone's sin and cleanse them? You know what every Christian will say? Absolutely. If you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you're going to be forgiven of your sins. You'll be saved for all of eternity. But if you ask the same average believer, can God and will God heal? Then there's a hesitancy. And I don't know about that. Why is it that we are the exact opposite? We believe God will forgive anyone, but not heal anyone. Friends, the gospel is the same throughout all generations. And you know what the Bible says in Psalms 103? That not only does God forgive all our iniquities, he heals all of our diseases. And sometimes we have to stand in that. Sometimes we have to, just like the children of Israel had to fight Jericho and they had to fight Ai and they had to fight the Canaanites and the Jebusites and the Hittites and they had to go to war with all the giants of the land. Sometimes we as Christians have to go to war over sickness. Right now I fight disease in my body. Right now I fight it every single day. And every day I speak to it. Every day. You know, here's the difference with Christians. And, and, and see, here's where I want to encourage you, my friends, as we preach through the book of Mark. You and I, if you've been in the church world long at all, you and I have seen these things abused. We've seen crazy people do crazy things. Come on, right or wrong? But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't take something that has been abused and neglect it. Here here is my point. As Christians, I'll tell you my view of how I interpret the word of God. Not only my view as a pastor and as a Bible teacher, but my view as a Christ follower and a man who is fighting disease in his body right now. As a Christ follower, I do not deny that sickness is not in my body. I don't pretend, I don't hype things up, I don't, I don't pretend and be fake and try to wishful thinking. I don't deny that sickness is there. What I deny is it's right to be there. Do you see what I'm saying? And in the Gospels, Jesus went about healing and doing good and setting free all those who were oppressed by the devil. We are going to walk through many, many healings throughout the book of Mark. While the book of Mark is the shortest book of the four Gospels, it records more miracles 
than any other gospel. And why does it record these things for us? Because Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And just as God had the ability to forgive in the pages of the Bible, he has the ability to forgive today. And just as Christ had the ability to heal in the pages of the Bible, my friends, he has the ability to do the same today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You can get out of balance with these things. You can get, but listen, just like you can get in one side of the ditch, you can also get in the other. And we've all seen churches that are in the one ditch where it's craziness and it's like an insane asylum. And then there's that other side where God doesn't do what he used to do. Friends, that's the other side of the ditch. In the middle of the road are those who believe the Bible And they believe God's the same today, yesterday, and forever. Now, I don't want to be a Christian who says, I believe, but. I don't want to be one of those. I don't want to be one of the Pharisees who says, well, God can forgive a sin, but he can't heal a body. Or in their case, God can heal a body, but he can't forgive a sin. No, I want whole faith, complete faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Christ challenges them and he says, which is easier to say, pick up your bed and walk or your sins are forgiven. Now, verse 10, note this with me. He says, but these things are so that you will believe the son of man has the authority to forgive sins on the earth. Again, the main thing is the main thing. Yes, I believe in healing, but let me tell you what you need more in healing. You need salvation. Let me tell you what this church needs more than miracles. We need the preaching of the word. The main thing is the main thing. So he says, these things are so you may believe the son of man has the authority, not the ability, the authority to forgive sins on the earth. Note the title, son of man. Just if you're going to take notes, note this, and then I'll begin to draw us to a conclusion. Note, the Son of Man. This is a messianic title for Christ. What it means is God in human form. The term first appears in Daniel chapter 7 in the Old Testament. Mark is going to use this title for Jesus 14 times in his 16 chapters. The four Gospels is going to use the title Son of Man 80 times. This is a major theme for Christ. And why does he say son of man? Because John 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word became, the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's God incarnate. It's Emmanuel, God with us. And and do you remember what the Pharisees and scribes, remember what they said in verse number uh, seven? Why this man, the derogatory, this human, this flesh, this man. And then Christ says, no, the son of man. Do you see the link between verse seven and verse 11? Or 10, rather. Now, verse 11, I would love to have heard the authority and the voice of Jesus. He looks at the paralytic and he says, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go home. I can't imagine the authority behind those words. I can't imagine the authority and the tone of his voice. I can't imagine his piercing eyes as this miracle right before their eyes takes place. And verse 12, and the man arose and took up his bed. Now, why do you suppose Christ told him to go home? You know why? I'm telling you, as a disabled man, I know how comfortable home feels. 
I know how comfortable it feels to sit at home. But see, when he tells him to go home, he's going to go home completely different. He's going to go home an absolute changed man. He's saying, go tell your family. Go tell your neighbors. Go tell your neighborhood what Christ has done for you. And then there's a phrase, lastly, that I want you to note. I would circle this in my Bible. Do you remember the crowd that would not let him in? Mark is very specific. Mark says, and before them all, he walked out. (laughs) The same crowd that wouldn't let him in parted to let him walk out. Amen. Hallelujah. And let me tell you, there are people from your past. There are people you grew up with. There are friends you used to hang out with. There's family from your past who told you you'll never change. You'll never be any different. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never be anything different than what you've always been. Oh, no, my friend, pick up your testimony, take your bed, and walk before Christ in front of them all. Amen. It's your story. It's your testimony. It's the life change that Jesus has wrought in you. Live Jesus in front of everybody. Tell them how he changed your life. Tell them how you were broken, how you were undone. You were apart from Jesus and how one day the master, he touched you and he changed you. Oh, hallelujah. Friends, it's your bed today. It's your story. It's your testimony. And God never told you to leave it in the past. He said, pick it up and take it home with you. Let it serve as a reminder This is who I was before Jesus. This is how I met Jesus. And this is who I am today after Jesus. Oh, glory to God. You have a testimony. You have a story. And God wants you to craft it. God wants you to tell it. Go today to preachingchristchurch.com craft your story maybe you're here today and you're still crippled you haven't been touched by the Lord Jesus Christ right now with every every head bowed, every eye closed you've not been forgiven yet you're like the crowd you've been curious you're like the crowd, you're interested but you've never been lowered down through the roof and today you feel your need for Jesus Oh, hallelujah. Today, you need to be touched by the master. Let me tell you, he'll touch you. He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you. He'll change you. He'll restore you. He'll make you a new creation. Old things will pass away and everything will become new. I'm telling you, on the authority of God's word. The same Jesus. This same Jesus in Capernaum is in Kingsport today. And he'll touch you right now with your heads bowed, your eyes closed. Call on him right now. Pray with me right now, right now. You watching online, you listening, you pray right now, wherever you are, pray right now. Lord Jesus Christ, pray this in your heart. Lord Jesus Christ, touch me. Forgive me. Save me. I need you, Jesus. And I call on you today. Forgive my sins. Cleanse my life. And be the Lord of my life.